Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final session. We're very excited. Hopefully, your workshops today went well. I know some of the rooms we had a little bit of technical glitches, but that's expected in the virtual environment. But this is the first time for all of us. We're so excited. We have a lot of you here. Remember, stick around because we're going to do prizes at the end of this mental health panel. We're very excited. We have three very dedicated and experienced presenters on the panel. Kyle is going to moderate this. She'll go through their bios and introduce them. Um, but we have three panelists. We're very, very happy to have them here today. We're going to allow a lot of time for you to put your questions in the chat. So please don't hesitate to do that. And um, stick around to the end. So we'll see you in a few. Thank you, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Kevin, Lucille, can you hear okay? Because I have some people that are saying they can't hear. I just want to make sure we're good with sound. Can anybody hear me? You can. Okay, good. Okay, great. Thanks, Mary. Um, we're going to jump right in. So I'm so uh, thrilled and excited uh, to be able to present uh, and moderate this event for you all. Um, we know mental health and social emotional learning is so, so important right now for our children. We have three fabulous uh, with us. Um, the first is Dr. Lorna Lewis. Um, she is uh, one of our wonderful school superintendents. She is currently at Malvern uh, on Long Island. Um, she had been a superintendent previously of East Williston and Plainview Old Bethpage. She's also past president of the New York State Council of School Superintendents um, and chair of the Curriculum Committee. Um, and she, she also uh, has been a longstanding educator that has been recognized by the NAACP, the Korean Parent Association, and St. John's University Chapter of Phi Delta Kappa. Um, we're so excited, uh, Lorna. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, on the line also we have Lisa Malady. She is a vice president of the New York State School Counselors Association. Um, she's been in education for 32 years. First as a um, grade school teacher in Delhi, and then as an elementary school counselor in Copate. She is currently the elementary vice president for the New York State School Counselors Association. So Lisa, thank you so much for being on here. And our last panelist is Stu Pollack. Stu um, has been teaching elementary school in, since 1992 um, and, and worked as a classroom elementary school teacher, a junior high school mathematics chair, an elementary assistant principal, and is now serving in his 17th year as principal of the Sycamore Avenue Elementary School in Connectquat. Um, he's also the current president of the School Administrators Association, or SANES, our principal's uh, uh, colleague. So Stu, Lorna, and uh, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are going to jump right into questions. We are going to have uh, four or five questions we're going to go through, and then we're going to turn things over to the chat. Um, and so let's just jump right in. Um, and I'm going to start with, hold on, let me pull up my questions. I'm going to start with Lorna. Lorna, yesterday was the deadline for... So you froze oh. on me. Oh, can you hear me, Lorna? I, I started to hear you. Um, I, um, you said yesterday was the deadline for the submission of plans, and yes. then I didn't hear the rest of the question. Yes, and then so talk to me about what school districts should be planning for in mental health and social emotional support when we go back. So yes, uh, we all submitted our plans, um, most people anyway, there were some uh, uh, some extensions given to some districts, um, and I understand Westchester did do some extensions, but um, there, part of our plans has to be an inclusion for social emotional learning. So that that's a requirement that the state has made, um, but beyond that, we know that children have been separated from the normal for a long time. They, and without very much notice. And so schools should have been implemented some form of uh, social emotional learning, even online. So uh, they should have been doing assemblies. Our counselors should have been maintaining groups 
uh, children, you know, the ones that were really affected in the high school, for example, the juniors who are rising seniors who are coming back in September, all of a sudden they had uh, the rug pulled out from under them. Class of 2020 had the rug pulled out of, under them, but they're on their way to college. The kids who are juniors, they still have to have all the processes for college, going to college and being supported. But also, um, you know, we have guidance counselors, social workers, and psychologists who have to be busier than they've ever been because you have to creatively think of ways to make the connections for children. And um, guidance counselors at the elementary level, and I know not every district has one, but I would encourage PTAs to, um, to lobby for having guidance counselors and social workers at the elementary level because the work that needs to be done in supporting students is not just the content. I've said many times that Maslow is going to trump Bloom in our journey back to school, that we first have to feel safe, we have to feel supported before we can start instruction. So, um, you know, so our guidance counselors and our social workers have to put together plans to support not only the children, but also the parents, because a lot mm -hmm. of our plans are hybrid plans. And so what, you know, parents have been thrust to become, you know, substitute teachers, and they also need the support. So we should be doing assemblies. We should be doing some work, parent universities with the parents, so that they can be just as supportive. But SEL has to take a front seat rather than a back seat as we develop our plans. I hope you heard some of this. Oh, somebody asked about Maslow and Bloom. Um, you know, you know. Can I say something, uh, Kyle, about that? Um, Maslow is a psychologist who basically stated that there are levels um, that we go through in life, and the first level for anyone is to feel safe. That food and security is the first level that we need to take care of before we start thinking about acceptance and. Or all, all the higher levels of of, um, of being. So Maslow, I always say Maslow trumps Bloom because Bloom speaks about cognitive, you know, the content areas and and how do we deliver instruction. So right now I'm saying that rather than focus on how we deliver instruction, we need to first think about being safe and making sure that children are feeling ready to learn, <clears throat> feeling comfortable to learn rather than to go full head into thinking about what's the curriculum, how do we deliver it. We must, they must feel safe. Teachers must feel safe. Every, parents must feel safe before we can start talking about curriculum. I dropped there for a bit, so my apologies. Lorna, thank you so much. Um, we're going to transition over to Stu. Um, you know, I know Stu and Lorna, I know you both um, you know, very well and long time in education. Stu, as a building leader, uh, what do you think mental health support for our children look like? And is it different than what we've been doing in the past school year? Sure. Well, first, let me just say hello, because Lorna and I go way back to so hi, Lorna. It's nice to see you. It's, I thought that was you. Yeah, <laughs> that was me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was a beginning teacher. Wow. Long time ago, three village wow. days. <laughs> um, you know, well, first off, I, I mean, everything that Lorna says is is um, on the forefront of our minds. Our children need to feel safe, um, and and you know, coming to school before any learning can get done, right? So it's something we we all know. Um, but, you know, you, you, Lorna also said something uh, that resonated with me tremendously, and it was talking about the support for parents. Now, um, I'm here representing um, Saney School Administrative Association of New York State as its president, um, but I am an elementary school principal, and I've been, for the most part, um, uh, of my career in the, K, in the K-5, K-6 realm. Um, but I do also have teenage kids, a couple of high school graduates, so um, I, I, I'll, I'll try and keep kind of the K-12 continuum along. But as far as um, the elementary school, what I learned from the closure is that um, of a, a plethora of, of issues that we've never had to deal with before, um, or at least not to the degree or not with the same... Um, 
the, 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 the nuances of, of dealing with, with a pandemic. Um, so when, when I think about mental health, kind of uh, when I think globally, like for, 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 a, for a community, right? So as an elementary school principal, I'm thinking of, of really this, this hamlet that I'm, 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 I serve. Um, we, I've been in my building for a long time, and principals who've been in their buildings for a long time know the families and, and know many of the issues uh, that that uh, they, they deal with and they manage. And we build trusting relationships where, where parents can come and talk to us when we need to address a student's mental, uh, social, emotional well-being. But with with the COVID coming, um, you know, we had to uh, think in, in in such a in so many different ways that. We're, we're happening at such a, a, a rapid pace. So, for example, I would gather the teachers together and we would talk about, um, you know, the, the, the stress, uh, the financial stress in people's homes who maybe never felt it before, uh, trying to stay on top of those families who were directly affected, either with someone infected uh, in the house or a loved one in the house, because all of this affects how we respond to children logging online for remote instruction, right? So, so um, it, 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 it's information so that we can address them appropriately and not cause um, uh, unnecessary stress on families. Um, so this was like an awakening uh, dur during the, the, the crisis because, well, it was still the crisis, but during that closure from March to the end of June. Um, because there was a tremendous amount of pressure parents were putting on themselves and parents were putting on their, uh, in some cases, putting on their kids, uh, little kids to like, uh, to, to, to get all the work done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my, my point is, is that there were all these issues that we had to relearn and figure out how to address as time went on. So what, so my feeling is, and how I lead my uh, school with regard to anything, is um, to try and maintain, I think it's very important that we maintain personal contact with as many people. We just make it a priority. So um, in other words, we don't, we, we can't wait around to find out if, not every if everything is not okay in, in a home, we have to reach out. We have to make sure that um, um, they 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 hear us. Um, and Lauren, when Lorna talked about the elementary uh, uh, counselor, uh, I'm lucky in my district. Every elementary school has a social worker and a psychologist, and we still feel like we're running short. So staff is definitely uh, an issue. Um, and then, and then, you know, one of the things that I think is so, so important for us to remember is that, you know, the thing that we do best with kids is, um, is when we're with them. So we, we, we've lost all this, this information from kids during, during, by, by not being able to be with them, by not seeing how they, um, how they come in. Are they smiling? Are they their normal self? Are they extra quiet? Are there, are there things that, um, uh, we just, Things that we would see in a, in this in on a first glance in the morning, um, we don't we don't know because we're not with them. So th these are all like the new things, you know. And now along those lines, you know, if, if we're going to go back to school and kids are wearing masks, half their face will be you know covered, and and we just have to be very cognizant of 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 being proactive um, and 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 all the things that we're good at, you know, and empathizing and 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 um, supporting children and families. Uh, I mean, there's really so much. It, it's hard to put into a question because I think I've probably talked a little too much too about this, but um, um, it, it's, it, it is a priority. Um, and and um, I, like I said, I could go on. I mean, the, I, I think the key is uh, encouraging people and staff and school staff to be as proactive as possible uh, and letting parents understand that we are here to, 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 to kind of support them through through all this. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's, it's a great transition to Lisa, where I want, really wanted to talk to you about by the time our children go back into school after Labor Day, they're going to be physically out of school buildings for six months. So what do parents, what can we do now? What can parents and families do now to help that transition? Because we do have, you know, a month and two weeks before school. Our schools are planning on going back, uh, many of them, um, and so parents that are choosing to send their child back into school buildings, what can we do now to support them? 
Uh, and first, I want to say thank you for this opportunity to share my ideas and thoughts with everyone. It is important. I am uh, grateful to be an elementary counselor. Thank you for the shout outs. And if anybody wants to advocate for elementary counseling in your building, NISCA, New York State School Counselor Association, our website has tons of materials about how elementary counseling is different from social work and psychologists and our roles, and we are pushing for elementary counselors in every building in New York State. Um, thank you for that time for that plug. Uh, thinking about going back, my, the first word that comes into my mind is resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back. Many kids are just probably going to be banging at the door saying, take my temperature and let me in. I know so many kids were missing being part of the school experience, just as we were missing being with the children. Then there will be those that will not want to go back. Um, I love what Stu is talking about in terms with communicating and reaching out. If you do have a child or if you know of a student who is hesitant and already in, on the anxiety level, I would say reach out even before school begins. Um, resilience means bouncing back. How do we bounce back? We had trauma. We had fear. We have gone through something we haven't gone through before. We didn't know what was going to happen, but at least now we do. What we can do as parents and teachers, we can talk to our triumphs during COVID. We can talk about how we flatten the curve and what does that mean, less people are getting sick. We can talk about the things that we know, fact over fear, face masks will help you. And if a child can have one idea that is going to keep them safe, have them feel the power and that strength that a face mask will help them, help them understand that distance is okay, and to use their words and to reach out and to be able to give hugs from a distance. I know in an elementary school we do a lot of hugging, and I know I'm going to be doing a lot of this when I see the children. I would also prepare the kids by getting back to a kind of reality. We are all out of practice getting up and going to school and just getting up at a normal time. So as we draw closer to the time going back to school, physically change your hours to more reflect learning. Uh, try to have meal times that reflect as the normal meal times during school time. So try to transition both physically in the things that you're doing every day, and emotionally. And if I can add one more thing, speak to how there are helping people and caring people that are going to take care of them everywhere and wherever they go. This goes elementary school to high school. Uh, this is important for resilience to be able to know that you have people that you can turn to if things go bad again, we, are, we have a structure that is going to keep children safe, whatever it is. Um, and grit is being able to reach those long-term goals. So the goal right now in the short term is get back to school, see how it goes, and it may change and it may not. The long-term goal is going to be strong no matter what happens. Okay. Now, I do have some, some questions I wanted to chime in. One we just um, got, and Lorna, if you could talk about this a little bit. Um, if a family chooses because of medical reasons or for a choice to have remote, um, how do they really help integrate and support that family who may not be in a school building, the child may not be in a school building, but they, but they still want to connect with that child and the family who is now learning at home? Well, I think the um, the guidelines that were put out almost requires districts to accommodate uh, students who medically cannot be um, in school. So many districts are thinking about having um, having some kind of uh, remote connection so that they, they would have a camera somewhere in the classroom. Of, of course, I know that we have to work this out with our various um, unions. But having a camera in the classroom so that the um, the children who are home are seeing the same thing as the children who are in 
in school. So that's one um, option, but if that option doesn't work, um, the district would have to set up a, a completely virtual connection. So that means that you, you might end up, the, in fact, you might have several districts coming together to host a virtual school if, if, if the cameras are not allowed in the classroom. So you may not have your own teacher, but you will have a third grade teacher who um, may be in a consortium of schools, but um, so that you could continue instruction. That's the content area. That's the bloom area of things. Yeah. But, um, but in terms of taking care of the socio-emotional part of it, we have to have the guidance counselors and the social workers um, be the ones who are reaching out to the students on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I know in my former district, because I've just left one district, I'm moving to another, we actually had guidance counselors um, checking into our Google Classrooms. They had the op they were, had the ability to go in and um, check on kids in the Google Classroom, kids who might not be engaged or or having difficulty, and they had one on one with the students. You know, so the ability, even though it's a, a virtual world, and then of course if the one on one doesn't work, they actually physically would pick up the phone and call them. Or in some cases, um, very, very um, few cases, we actually ended up going to the home to visit with the student because it was such a critical case. So I think there are no rules on this, but the only rule is connection, mm -hmm. that every child needs to feel connected and every teacher needs to feel connected to the community. So whatever will work, there's no one size fits all because everyone has varying needs. There are children who might be suicidal. There are children who might be having difficulty at home because they're, they're in an abusive situation. They're all, the entire continuum has to be recognized. And we have to have a crisis team within every school that is able to respond to whatever the vagaries are. You know, you can't say this is the rule. But clearly, that is led by your, your guidance counselors, your social workers, and your psychologists. Like, we have to, and I have actually said that some of the testing that we do needs to be put aside. We need to put aside the regular testing that we do, the benchmarking and all of that, because, as I said, Maslow, taking care of the needs of kids mm. before we start um, um, sorting them by, by ability or sorting them by disability. We've got to take care of their social needs, emotional needs. Mm -hmm. Lorna, I know I couldn't agree with you more, and that's a fantastic transition to our next question. Um, Stu, let's talk about the collaboration between parents, um, you know, building leaders, teachers, staff. How can, you know, parents and educators now, we have about 250 of them on the line, how can they work together now um, to really address collaboration and trauma that students, are there things that um, PTAs and educators and principals and superintendents should be doing now together? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to think that that that's always been been going on, right? I mean, I mean, with uh, collaboration with with our PTAs, our parent groups, uh, individual parents, um, as staffs, uh, you know, kind of internally, just with, with like just staff initiatives, and then uh, uh, broader building initiatives, all the time focusing on social emotional uh, health. Um, the so really, if this, if our core beliefs about how important uh, the the social well being of uh, the social emotional well being well being of children are uh, remains, the conditions just kind of guide us in in what our actions are. So so everything that you're saying, um, you know, obviously I can't speak for every school, but I would think it, it should be more the norm. Um, th there's always been an SEL, social emotional learning component to the day. Um, the, but, but the issues now, um, again, because of the remote instruction, which, um, you know, made it more difficult. We had to be very creative and, um, 
and, and teachers did amazing, amazing things. I, I mean, we had teachers visiting homes and dropping off gifts and, and, and balloons on birthdays and, and any way to, to maintain the connection. Um, the school connectedness is really, you know, just, just, in my opinion, the most important thing. Uh, you know, children, families need to feel connected. So, so really, in my head, Everything is, is, is always collaborative in nature, right? Because if it's not, you know, even if it's um, an initiative, let's say that 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 uh, me as the administrator is just put, you know, uh, putting forth uh, whatever feedback I get and how it works, and and we have to kind of re reflect and get feedback and seek feedback from people and then respond to that feedback. Um, and the bottom line is. You know, I'll ask parents, I mean, is your child happy right now? Because if she's happy right now, this is, you know, this is not urgent, right? We're going to take care of this right now, but your child's happy. Uh, if your child's not happy, we have to dig in right away. And, um, you know, maybe as, a, as an elementary school with 430 kids, in my, in, in my head, um, we just take care of each and every single one of them. I, I'm, I'm uh, and they're little, right? So, so, so. We're, we're do, we do a lot of interaction with parents as well. Um, is, is is to me, it's just it's it's just staying on top of each and every one. Um, and and now more um, more than ever because of the extra challenges and the the additional stresses and anxieties that kids have. I mean, there are a lot of kids who are anxious about coming back because because of COVID. Uh, you, you know, I was talking to a parent the other day who's very nervous that the child won't even leave the house. Being in public, masks in, intimidate and scare this child. You know, and, and and that child may come to school with everybody wearing masks. So we have to figure out ways how to help them adjust. Meanwhile, by asking our staff, who's also dealing with this in their own way personally, uh, and with their own children and maybe elderly uh, adults uh, who, are, or who are more at risk. I mean, it, this is something I've never in, in my entire career been gone through a period where we are literally, we are all in this together kind of a thing, you know. And, and um, I, I, I actually think um, it, in talking to many, many of my colleagues, principal colleagues, teacher colleagues, friends who are, who are in education, that um, so many of us actually feel closer to our, our communities than ever before. Um, you know, there's, there's been a, a very interesting process um, as people try and, I, I think people, uh, you know, try and be a little bit more mindful of what we have. Um, but at the same time, we have to be, we have, we can't sit still, we can't take for granted um, that, that things are going to just happen because they're not there with us. And we have to we have to constantly check in on them. Um, and, and and to me, as a principal, that's my message to teachers. Um, and um, you know, I'm happy to say that we never have an issue with that. But it's also my message to parents: you got to keep checking in with us too. You know, something uh, you know, and and try and and work to always maintain a sense of comfort that. The, the parents know they, that they're, they're not bothering us. Talk to us. Let us know. Even if you think it's the smallest little thing, um, you know, but if it's affecting your, your child or your family or your, your, your home and it's something that we could, that we could impact in some way for the better, do not be shy. And, and, and so there's that two-way street, but we got to make parents feel comfortable that we need to make them feel like they could trust us, and that that involves um, a lot of follow through, a, a lot of sincerity, um, and um, you know that that's kind of you know how 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 I'm, I'm viewing this in the way I think principals and school leaders uh, should. And Sue, I appreciate that. And you had touched on something that question that we got from a number of parents. Um, and Lisa, I'm going to ask you to ask this one. Um, you know, a number of, of parents and families had posted that they have either a child who typically has school refusal issues or a child who is fearful of math or a special education a student who is immunocompromised and mom and dad now have to tell the child, even though they want to go back to school, that they can't go back to school. So how do parents and families, you know, talk to their children about those issues, about 
you know, they're scared to go back or they really can't go back because of, um, you know, physical or, um, you know, immunosuppressed kind of issues. What do parents do in those cases? Yeah, those are two very different conversations. Uh, yeah. One, when you're scared to go back, you are building your, your safety net, you're building the idea of strength, and you are building like building blocks, like Legos. You have to construct with the child whatever they need that will help them to get through. Every child has a different uh, recipe. Nobody makes the same minestrone soup the same way, so you have to communicate with the child, with the teachers, and actually I would believe that your school knows the child who is feeling afraid. Um, I know who I'm most worried about, and I will tailor my, my program and my approach to that child. So for the child who's afraid, speak fact over fear. And not only fact over fear about COVID, but all the different ways that we are we take care of ourselves. We have in our house fire alarms, and we have the things in the house. Point that out and say, that keeps us safe. When you're driving, seatbelt, that keeps us safe. You as a parent who has an anxious child, you have to have that continual dialogue in the world. That keeps us safe. You see that stop sign? That keeps us safe. You see my cell phone? I can get help anytime. That keeps us safe. The child who is immunocompromised, um, this is a different world and a different journey. And it is, um, it is hopefully not unique. And what I would like is to be able to have the kids who can't go to school be able to hook together and the PTA in the school can help with this. Those children need to not feel isolated. And how do you not feel isolated? By reaching out to kids who are like you. Maybe through the doctor, maybe through the pediatrician, maybe through if there's a therapeutic support. There can be a group setting. Um, but everybody's story is unique. And I would speak to the story in positive terms and, and let them know you are okay where you are. And it is someday this is what will happen. For today, this is what is. The grass is and green that, and the sky is blue. And there's some things we just can't change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lisa, I think that's, that's great. And I know um, in a great transition, again, to our next question, and Lorna, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, you know, long-standing long uh, superintendent um, and, and who I cherish you near and dear to my heart. And um, I know that you, alongside both um, the School Counselors Association and SANES and the Superintendent Association, have been advocating for funding for mental health services and guidance counselors. And so question about that. You know, we know ratios are not where they needed to be before for school support staff and, and professionals. So now we're going to have, a, you know, a number of additional issues of trauma and um, fear and stigma. How are we going to support those kids? And what can we do, I think, as parents and families and PTA to try to help school districts do that work? Well, I wish I could give you good news on that because right now we're waiting on Governor Cuomo and, of course, the federal government uh, because the federal government will, will be um, might be giving us some funds in New York to um, to tell us the story on state aid. And unfortunately, we're, we're under the threat of losing 20% in state aid. And I just spoke with Newsday today. If we do that, then really all even the plans that we have that we submitted on July 31st may not be we may not be able to deliver on so you know we have to get to our legislators and it's not just the state legislators but the federal legislators for them to understand that this is for a small district like Malvern it's a million dollars for a district like Brentwood it's 10 million dollars so this is very serious. You know, you cannot just deliver on the, the social distancing, the PPEs, the additional staffing, the professional development, all of the things that we know need to be in place. We need social workers. We need guidance counselors. We need to look at the ratios. We need to reduce those numbers. 
without funding. And it is really important that we work together with the PTA and all of our associations to bring that message to our legislators that this cannot happen safely without the appropriate funding. And having guidance counselors and social workers and maintaining the distancing and the PPE, all of those things need to be in place if we are going to open schools safely in September. Yeah, and, and Lorna, we totally agree. Um, just on that point, if people on this call go to our website, um, so go to nyspta.org, and then to the Advocacy tab, um, you can drop down to uh, uh, words that say take action now um, and that brings you to a number of alerts that we have going into Congress at least right now on that funding issue Lorna is talking about. So make sure you do take action there and I know we are working with all of your associations on the same type of uh, funding request. Um, Stu, I'm going to put you on the hot seat because mm -hmm. we always give our, give our people homework um, and one thing <laughs> We tell them in an earlier session that we had was that it's important to work with your school building principal right now more than ever to really have virtual parent meetings and, and have communications come out. What do you think we should do as PTA? Um, should we be reaching out to our building leaders and saying we'll do this together? Should we be asking principals what their plan is and, and offering our assistance? What, where, do, where do you think that relationship should be right now? Um, well. <clears throat> Could you just clarify, like when you say do do this together, uh, what in, um, in what specifically uh, are you referring to? I mean, there's plenty, plenty that we should be collaborating with with our PTAs, um, and then there's some stuff that really is just like kind of internal. Um, I so, think the question, so the question is, parents, uh, you know, parents are feeling that they want to have more, uh, more conversations with school building leaders because they are afraid. The plans just got in yesterday. Do you plan. think? Do you think school building leaders are going to have more virtual meetings? Are they going to have kind of parent sessions online to talk about the plan? What do you think that looks like, or what do you think we should suggest that looks like? Um, I, I. But yeah, you did put me on the hot seat because uh, um, it, I've, um, I'm going to, let me just think about this for a second about like what you should ask for. I mean, I would presume, and I don't know, you know. Yeah, it, so you think, think, about that. think about that for a minute and then I'll go over to, to Lisa. We'll come back. Does that work? Yeah, that would, that would help. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lisa, in two, two um, questions, total different spectrums we just received. We have parents that have younger children that are really struggling with remote learning. And then we have parents um, on the chat of older students, junior and seniors, who are feeling really left out. You know, they're not going to maybe have sports, they're not going to have their clubs. How do we support those children, two totally kind of different age groups? Oh, and, and here's the difference, too, and we were talking before about Bloom and, and Maslow's needs. I'm talking about Erickson's developmental stages. A teenager has different needs from an elementary person. At that point, their friendships and their social circles are the key to their feeling good about themselves. So, of course, if you're not having your connections with your peers, um, then that's a difficult then, they, then kids are going to be suffering from that. Um, now, as we are in distance learning, let's hope when we go back to classes, the teachers will be able to have remote connections with kids. And I, Stu, if you don't mind me catching up on there, maybe you can ask principals if there can still be some enrichment programs after school. Maybe you can start doing the art club or the computer club or the chess club. There are clubs that kids join and belong to in school that help them with their connection. We can ask schools and principals, how can we get our kids to be able to connect to each other? If there's an advisor sitting in the classroom, there can be an advisor are sitting in a Google classroom. So my hope for teenagers is that they figure out a very in smart way to get connected to other teenagers. That would be the best way to help them. Now for my little ones who are having trouble with um, distance learning, and I won't forget when I had a, an iPad tour of a backyard really fast by a very quick five-year-old who just wanted to show me how he played on his swing set and not quite understanding that we had to sit still. I find that as 
you are working with the youngest children, it is smart for the teacher, the counselor, the social worker to work with the parent first. Get the parent strong. Get the parent comfortable with what's happening. And then it's up to us as teachers to be really engaging, developing creative visual things that you can do online in the computer that really wow the kids. Um, I've tried magic tricks and horns and bells and all kinds of fun stuff. So um, for the little ones, I would think the parents need to be very comfortable themselves and set a time and a place and a practice to get used to it. Um, I keep going back to that schedule and that routine, and I think that practice is such an important thing for kids, and doing it well before it is ex you're expected to do it. Yeah, Lisa, that's, that's a great transition. Sue, I want to shift a little bit. Um, and and in, Lorna had typed in the chat that she felt that you know, we really needed to have some really good PD early on to support teachers and educators. And what, Sue, what are your thoughts on that? And then what are your thoughts? Someone had put in the chat about really, as, as Lorna had mentioned, starting with a, so almost social and emotional learning sessions as opposed to the math and English in the beginning. Really start starting to focus on the support of the schools. What are your thoughts on really focusing on some early teacher PD as a school build, building leader on these issues? Oh, I, I think the PD is an essential component to this. Um, I, I, I think, um, you, you know, like initially, like when we first, when we first closed, uh, there was a very steep learning curve for teachers uh, to provide you know, the best instruction we can, you know, so, uh, so abruptly. And, and I will tell you just from my, my small sample of what I've seen in my district, um, it, it, it was, uh, teachers had an amazing positive energy to try and make this work. And, and they just had to be provided with the PD and the district, you know, my district did a really nice job with, with online PD. But I do think that, um, where we are, you know, we are heading towards a time now where we could use what we've learned, certainly, but where we're heading into instructional practices, you know, learning instructional practices in, in settings that we're just not used to, right? So, so the, the, whether it be remote or whether it be in school, uh, I mean, the social distancing guidelines, per, you know, prevents many, many teachers to teach in, um, in a collaborative workshop type style where kids are huddled in close and working on a problem together or, or uh, for a teacher to get down on, you know, on one knee and, and, and conference with a child. So all of that, you know, there's a lot that teachers uh, and staff could figure out uh, to do it safely, but we also want to be effective. So the PD... Uh, on, on how to effectively provide instruction, I think is essential. And of course, um, we the PD for uh, supporting kids' social emotional well being uh, with the um, myriad of, of of issues that kids are, are facing. Um, and you know, we just we have to we have to figure out how to do a lot of stuff. But but uh, but Providing PD um, is essential. It really is. Uh, it's like this yeah, is I, I paradigm agree. shifts happening at once. I agree, Stu, and I know, um, you know, your association and you as president have talked about this extensively, you know, and I just want to thank you uh, for always wanting to support teachers uh, personally and, and for saying these. Um, I know um, that relationship is so important. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one last question of everybody, and then um, I, I can't believe it. It's been, can you believe it? It's been 45 minutes already. It flew by. Uh, Lorna and Stu, I'm going to ask you the same question, um, but I want you to answer. Um, give me top strategy on what a school district you think should be doing right now to prep for social emotional learning mental health for students when we reopen. Well, I think um, certainly putting the personnel in place to be able to handle, um, you know, making sure you have the guidance counselors and social workers in place. But I think um, it's, it's guidance counselors can reach out to children in the summer. Um, to kind of get them ready. I think it's important, uh, Lisa spoke about the routines, 
before they come in in September, the, the little ones have to practice wearing a mask. They have to practice, um, you know, they're not going to be going to their cafeterias for lunch. They're going to be eating in their classroom. They have to practice washing hands very often. Uh, so all of those routines that need to be in place, we can start before they come in. Um, so that the, 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 and also explaining to them that things might change quickly. We need to be flexible. Um, you know, it, what happens if there's a case that's reported in the school? We may have to go back to virtual learning. So getting them prepared emotionally for change. Because, you know, we got the big transition in March, but this might happen again in September or October, explaining that things uh, are not permanent, that, you know, we're going to be prepared, but we're also going to uh, be prepared for change. Um, I think it's also important that parents and teachers are calm. Because if we're not calm, we're going to pass that fear. I think... Um, Lisa spoke about facts over fear. I think that was so important that we need to be the ones to share facts rather than fear. And I honestly think that every single administrator ought to take the Coursera course. Uh, that's Coursera.org. It's a free course that's offered by John Hopkins. I took it myself. It's only three hours long. And it explains contact tracing, but it does it in a way that I now have a very different understanding of the virus, and I have a very different understanding of what I can do. I think we need to do things to empower ourselves so that we're not operating out of fear. We have to become more knowledgeable about the virus. Um, um, it, it, and that was the way I became calmer, by understanding what contact tracing was, how we can diminish the virus within our own communities, what power we have. We have the power to change a trajectory. And the, the, the power is in you have to wear a mask, you have to wash, you can't wash often, wash your hands often, and you can't be in groups um, irresponsibly. So we have to learn what the rules are and say to the kids, if we practice these things, then we become safer for tomorrow. I think what Lisa said was so important. This is like what you talked about, Lisa, with the, um, with the fire alarm. or you know, These are all structures that we have in place. Yes, this is a very nasty virus. It's a little bit different from what we're used to. But we have a virus that if we practice the proper behaviors, we can control. It is not an uncontrollable situation. And helping kids to understand that is very important. Um, there are great books that are out there. One of them that I would, it's on Safe Share TV, Time to Come in Beer by, um, yeah, would you share that, please, by Kim St. Lawrence. It's a great one for little ones, for the little ones, to understand what social distancing is. Because, look, we don't even understand what social distancing is. So to help them understand so find some children's books and find some children's sites at kidshealth.org. That's a very good site uh, for helping you understand. Um, you know, so I think it's empowering ourselves so that we don't see this virus as something that's not controllable. It is entirely controllable. It is up to us to make it controllable. Yeah, I, I wish I, it was wonderful words, and I know um, I know that will alleviate uh, uh, some fear. And I thanks for sharing that, Coursera. Um, same thing, Lisa Stu. Last thought. Um, you know, we're, I can't believe we're almost out of time. Stu, last thought. You know, as a school building leader, um, what's the next few? Uh, what are we looking at? I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. The the next few. I took yeah, I said two last thoughts that you may have for everybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll, there's actually two I want to just share because um, everything that Lorna just said I, I think is really, really important um, from a building perspective as, as, as someone who, uh, as, a, a, as an elementary school principal, as a principal of a building that serves a community, I also um, 
I also think we need to seek information. So, you know, whether it's through, I mean, it's so easy to create a, a Google survey and, 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 and make a link and send it out. Um, and, and to just to try and get, gain insight as best as possible, um, from our parents about, you know, whether, whether it's a need their child has or whether there's something going on in the home that, um, you know, the child's doing okay right now, but, but could potentially turn into something. You know, we, uh, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about not just seeking the information from, from families about, you know, how, how things are going and what, what we need to be aware of and, and, um, and how we should address it. But, but, um, we need to make them feel comfortable and feel that uh, ownership of, of their school uh, where they could come and, and have a voice in the, in, at the very least, the principal's uh, office um, and have honest conversations. Um, the, the, the other thing um, that, kind of, that goes along with that was, Kyle, um, you asked me a question before, and I, and I fought a little time, um, but, but if I remember correctly, it was about... Um, you know what? What could you guys do as a as a PTA? And and what really? You know, look, the, if if the school and the PTA leadership has a really great relationship, as it, it should be, um, then you know they should always feel like there's open opportunities for open dialogue. Um, I absolutely believe that, welcome that, and, uh, and I do my best to encourage that as a principal where. Um, you know, so I always encourage um, people to be proactive. Don't be, don't, don't be, you know, don't wait uh, for for uh, us in the schools to, to to do something that you may be waiting for or something that you may need. You just ask. We have conversations. If it's something that that either can't be done, they'll, they'll, there should be a good reason, and and if it can, and what we could do together. Um, you know, again, I'll go back to that. The since school closed, the um, I have heard stories, and I can tell you about my school, which there was a, a a stronger sense of connectedness with our community and and our uh, our staff. Um, I, I mean, there were just I could go on and on and on to describe what what that looked like, but but um, I, I think we need to kind of grab that opportunity uh, in making sure that we are truly by by truly truly working together um in, in in allowing people the safety uh to to say what they want and 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 collaborate and disagree and 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 just make it better for the next you know for the next day um so i encourage you to do that so i think that's fantastic words and i know we always appreciate your collaboration um, and Lorna, your collaboration as building leaders with our with our units. Um, Lisa, last thoughts, and then we're going to do lots of prizes, as is PTA world. So, uh, last thought, Lisa. Sure, prizes are really good. Um, I want to talk about the importance of the conversations that you're having around your kids and even with yourself. Imagine you only have so much energy in a day. And there's a lot of negative talk, a lot of what if, and it's so bad, and why aren't they doing it this way. When you find yourself getting in one of those conversations, talking down, you are creating fear and supporting fear. You have to choose your words, choose your thoughts, and follow the, the ideas of we have rallied, we have connected, we are intelligent people, and we are going to be okay through this especially around your littlest kids, um, support your, your teachers and your, the decision makers with positive words. Use your positive energy to influence your children and actually ultimately to influence yourself. You have to find your peace with this. And when you're at peace, you'll give that peace to your kids. 
Yeah, Lisa, I, I think I just, uh, on behalf of the association, I'm going to turn things over to our president, but about on behalf of our association, we are so appreciative of the cooperation and partnership that we all have with our superintendents, our principals, our school counselors, and of course our great teachers. Um, I think this is what it's about at both the state level and the local level. Uh, Lorna, Stu, Lisa, cannot thank you enough. Um, I've put you on the spot more than once, and uh, you were always so wonderful and supportive, and I know our families so appreciate this past 55 minutes. It went by so quick. We need to do this more frequently. Um, I, for everybody on the call, I want to let you know um, on August 13th, we are having another one of these chats. And it's going to be really solely based on PTA issues as we reopen. So uh, reimagining PTA um, in, in a new school environment, please join us. It's going to be um, August 13th at 730. Um, thank you guys so much. I'm going to turn things over to Lori Zaman, who does have some prize announcements, and to say, uh, and to say goodbye. Just, we're going to do a quick switch here. Hi, everyone. Oh, that was an exciting panel. Thank you, uh, Lorna, Stu, Lisa. We're so happy that you did this for our members today. Um, we had over 250 people on the mental health chat panel. That's just incredibly awesome. Our whole weekend has been incredibly awesome. So we have 15 prizes to give away. We're really excited. And remember, we um, randomly selected you. And you have to be present. So if we call your name, you got to answer us in the chat uh, and let us know that you're here, and then we will mail you the prize. If you're on the phone, they can't answer. Yeah, if you're on the telephone, then they can unmute themselves, right? Yeah. They can't. No. So we're going to assume they're here if they were just calling. All right. Here we go. Right. First prize, Patty, our, our lovely, my lovely assistant here, Patty is going to show the prize. It's a canvas nautical bucket tote. And the winner is Tina Noonan from Nassau Region. Tina, are you here? Just answer us in the chat if you are. Next is a black tote faux leather zippered bag. And our winner for that is Judith Fernandez from South Central. So Judith, go ahead and let us know you're here. Another one, denim faux leather handle tote, Susan Root. Susan Root, are you here? Oh, Tina Noonan, yay, Tina Noonan is here. And so is Judith. Um, Susan Root is here, okay, we, are, we got you guys marked down. And we have another one of these, and the second winner for this is Pam Davis. Pam Davis, you here? And then we have our next prize. Pam Davis is here. Yay! Okay, golf umbrella. Pamela Nassau from Nassau Region. Pam, are you here? And then we're moving on to badge holder. Pam's here. Yay, Pam! Badge holder with rhinestones. Neil Johanning from Northeastern. Neil, my friend, are you still on? Next up. Blue travel mug with white. Neil is here. Yay! Blue travel mug with white logo. Jamie Landis, Nassau Region. Jamie, are you here? Jamie is here. Yay! Next up, organizer plastic PTA Royal Blue. Meryl Stevens, Westchester. Meryl, are you here? Meryl is here, yay! Okay, we're moving on to another badge holder. Uh, Kristen O'Brien from Nassau Region. Kristen, are you here? Kristen is here, yay! Blue Travel Mug. Linda Deptula from Suffolk Region. Linda, are you here? Linda is here, yay! Okay, organizer, Jennifer Ennis from Suffolk Region. Jen, are you here? Jen is here, yay! And Virginia D'Ambrosi from Suffolk, another organizer. Virginia, are you here? Virginia's here, yay! Okay. 
Next up, we have a $10 PTA store gift certificate that you can use either at any of our state events or you can call the office and place an order online. And first winner for that is Camille Newson from Suffolk Region. Camille, are you here? Camille is here, yay! Next up, $15 PTA store gift certificate. Jerry Lahane, one of our region directors, Northeastern. Jerry, are you on? Come on, Jerry, we're counting on you. <laughs> And last but not least, 15th prize, our grand prize, $24 PTA store gift card goes to Jen Colazzo from Northeastern Region. Jen, are you on? Dun, 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 dun. Come on, Jen. Yay! Nice! Well, that is great. Congratulations to all. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Kyle. Thank you, Kyle, for all you've done this weekend for, for this event. And Carol, our operations and events manager from the state office, you know, oftentimes they're behind the scenes. They don't get enough accolades. So thank you, Carol, for all you did. Again, Patty, for organizing the event. We're so proud of all of that is taking place this weekend. I can't, I just cannot. Thank you all enough. 660 people um, coming on to see our workshops, over 250 people in the mental health chat, 15 prizes. We're really proud of all you do for New York State PTA and the children. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and pray for your seeing us live at convention in November. Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,